when the choir was singing a few moments ago, earlier this week they were practicing. I was sitting in my office uh, as they were practicing, and I heard, the, I heard them sing this line, and I, I haven't ever given it a whole lot of thought, but it kind of struck me. They said, the song said, speaking of God, it said, you have no rivals. You know what a rival is? A rivalry is usually when two teams play each other, they don't like each other, and they usually both win some. They usually both win a okay, case. If one team always wins, it's not much of a rivalry, is it? Well, you realize this morning God has no rivals. You know, a lot of times we think that, we, we look at God, we look at the enemy, we think of the old picture of God on one shoulder and the, the devil on the other shoulder, and we're going to figure out which one's going to win. God don't have any rivals. He don't ever lose. He doesn't have any rivals. This morning, we're going to deal with the parable of forgiveness. We've been talking about the parables of Jesus for the last few weeks, if you've been here. So you want to join me in Luke chapter 7 this morning. If you have a Bible, Luke chapter 7. If you're going to follow along on your phone or a device or whatever app you want to use, I'm going to read from the New King James this morning, but we're going to address the parable of forgiveness. Those of you who attend regularly, you may hear this sermon and think, didn't we just hear this? Because if you think back to the beginning of this church year, we studied the book of Luke together and we're right back in it. So yeah, some of this might sound familiar to you because we addressed this back in February. Luke chapter 7, the parable of forgiveness. We're going to read verses 36 down through verse 50. You want to stand with me while we read? Luke 7, verse 36 through 50. I want to remind you this morning of what a parable is and why they, are, why they matter. Parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. It's a, it's a story drawn from everyday life to drive home a spiritual point. And today, well, we're actually going to see a parable inside of another story. And if you're not careful, you might miss that it's actually even a parable. Let's begin reading in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, down through verse 50. Then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman from the city, who was a known sinner, when she knew that Jesus was at the table in the Pharisee's house... She brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and she stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, speaking of Jesus, if he were a prophet... He would know what manner of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, that's the Pharisee's house, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon said, teacher, say it. Jesus said, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50 when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same will love little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this? Who even forgives sins. Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Lord Jesus, I pray this morning that you will help us to understand the parable of forgiveness. Lord, without forgiveness, we have no hope. Lord, this morning, will you open our eyes to our greatest need this morning and use, Luke, Luke, use the parable in Luke chapter 7 to show us how to live? Lord, we want to honor the reading of your word publicly and we want to obey it personally. Lord, we ask this morning that you would open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, and help our souls to be moved from conviction to obedience, and help us to find ultimate forgiveness only in you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
can be seated this morning. Without forgiveness, there is no Christianity. Without forgiveness, there is no hope. Without forgiveness, we have no salvation. Without forgiveness, heaven would be empty. Without forgiveness, there's no reason for any of us to be in this auditorium this morning. Forgiveness is the cornerstone foundational issue of Christianity, and it's the foundational issue that all of us wicked, dreadful sinners need. We all need the hope of eternal life, and the only way we receive forgiveness is based on what Jesus did for us, and as I've said to you many times, not in what we do for Him. Without a doubt, the one issue facing us all is our great need for forgiveness. Every person sitting on every row in this sanctuary is, has been in the need of forgiveness or is currently in the need of forgiveness. Forgiveness is the greatest need facing this congregation this morning. Your mother can bring you to church. Your father can pray for you. Your grandparents can read the Bible to you. This church can give you multiple avenues for ministry. We can have a ministry to kids, to students, to singles, to elderly, to married couples, to young adults, to broken homes. We can have a ministry for everything that everybody likes. But at the end of the day, it's up to you to ask God to forgive you of your sin. You may be here this morning and you may be thinking, Pastor, you don't know how wicked I am. I am beyond the reach of God. You may be thinking, I'm a drug dealer, Pastor. I'm a whoremonger. I'm a tax evader. I'm the town gossip. You don't know how wicked I am, preacher. I am beyond the scope of God's reach. I am beyond the reach of God's arm. I want to remind you this morning, Jesus didn't die on the cross because we won't sin. He died on the cross because our sin is so great. The good news of the gospel is that God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The beauty of the gospel, church family, isn't that we have a church to come to. The beauty of the gospel isn't that we gather in this room. The beauty of the gospel is that while you and me were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners. Not so that we won't sin, but because we do sin. And while we were sinners, think about this church, while we were spitting in the face of God, He willingly died for our sin. While we were enemies of Christ, Christ died for us. This morning, you may be thinking that your greatest need isn't forgiveness. You may be thinking, my greatest need is money, preacher. I need some money to pay my bills. If I had money, that would cure a lot of my problems. Or you may be thinking health. Health improvements is your greatest need. I need the doctor to give me a good report. That would cure everything. Or maybe this morning, you're thinking, my greatest need is career change. That's what I need. If I just had a different job, everything would be better. If I just had a new job with new employees, with new co-workers that were kind and generous to me, it would cure all my needs. I want to remind you this morning, church, your greatest need is forgiveness. All those things are important, and I'm not minimizing any of them. They all matter. Your career matters. Work matters. Money matters. Uh, health matters. It all matters, but none of it matters more than your soul. None of it matters more than forgiveness from Christ. Church members, we must not lose sight of this. If we're not careful, it'll slip to the back burner. And we'll get so caught up in whether or not we, we're serving in this way, whether or not the church does this, whether or not there's this many people serving here or serving there. We'll get caught up in all of those things and we'll miss the main point. And the main point is the forgiveness of souls. This parable will show us that this morning in Luke chapter 7 as we address it together. Let's just look at the text this morning. There's two main things and a main, one main point, but two overarching issues that we have in this text. The first is the power of Christ to forgive, and the second is the reason that some people love God more than others. But the main point I want you to see is this. Those who see Jesus as a great Savior are those who see themselves as great sinners. Those who see Jesus as a great Savior are those who see themselves to be great sinners. This, this, this text that we're seeing in Luke 7 is a clarifier text. It's a clarifying parable that clarifies for us the issue of forgiveness. It drives home the point that God can forgive the overwhelming amount of sin that we may commit. And that God can save even when we're not, quote, bad sinners. But we're all in need of His, sin, of, of his forgiveness for our sin. But this text is a sandwich parable. Now, if I was in your position and you were in mine and you were talking to me and said that this was a sandwich, I would listen. 
But what I want you to see very clearly, this text tells a story of Jesus coming to somebody's house. And when he gets to their house, they have some issues. And inside this story, there's a little parable. And if you're not careful, you'll miss the parable because you get caught up in the story. So the story is the bread on both ends of the sandwich, but the meat is the parable that Jesus tells in three small verses. This, for this story has four people. Simon, who's the Pharisee, who's the homeowner. The sinful woman that we don't know her name, Jesus. And then there's a group of people sitting around the table. Each one of these people has something unique to share or to give. The Pharisee invites Jesus to his home. We don't know why. He don't even like Jesus. <laughs> they're, as a matter of fact, they're the ones trying to oppose Jesus, and yet he invites him to his home. Why? We're not sure. But Jesus engages those who see the world different from him. And how did this sinful woman even get word to come? We don't know the answer to that either. But Jesus is going to reveal that he's the only one who has power to forgive. And then there's a group of people sitting around the table. Let's look at the text together this morning. There's only three things I'll get to at the very end, and we'll wrap it all up. But let's look at the text. Verse 36. Some think this Pharisee, Simon, was jealous of Jesus' large crowds that would follow him. Look at the text. Verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come and eat with him. I, I would, I, I'm glad that Jesus is engaging with this guy. I'm glad that Jesus is entertaining with this guy who doesn't see the world the way he sees it. Because many times, if we're not careful, we'll surround ourselves with only people who agree with us. Your faith will not be stretched if you only listen to people who always agree with you. There's a principle for here to us to learn. Jesus engaged with those who disagreed with him, even those who hated him. Now listen, there's a good chance if you said, hey, pastor, you know what? I hate you. I hate you. I hate your family. I hate your wife. I hate what you stand for. I hate the message you preach. You want to come over and eat supper with me? <laughs> that would be really hard to do. I mean, it would be hard. I'd be like, uh, can you just send me a gift card in the mail? We'll call it a day. <laughs> It would be hard to do, but Jesus does this very thing. Jesus engages with somebody who sees the world very differently than he does. Why? Church, listen. Those who don't know Christ see the world different than those who know Christ. And we must engage with them. We must not isolate from them. I've said this to you a thousand times. We cannot isolate into a holy huddle and hope the world out there comes to know Christ. It's our duty to engage with those who don't know who Christ is. Jesus does that with this Pharisee. Verse 37 and 38 introdu introduces us to the woman. Look at it. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. Well, that's a, that's a great way to be introduced, right? When she knew that Jesus sat at the table of this Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. She brought her best Estee Lauder. <laughs> I got two sisters. I know what that kind of stuff is. <laughs> she brought her best perfume. And stood at Jesus' feet weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed him with the fragrant oil. This introduces us to this woman that we don't know how she got there. We don't even know why she's there other than we see that she recognizes who Jesus is. But there's a symbolism here because there's a good chance this woman, actually it's, it's probably a guarantee, that she is a prostitute. Why? Because in the scriptures, when, we, when a woman is introduced as a sinner, that means that usually she's a prostitute. So if this woman is a prostitute, there's a symbolism that's taking place in this text. If she pours her oil on him, or her perfume on him, that perfume deals with her livelihood. If she is a prostitute, she uses that to entice men. She is now breaking that or pouring that out on him. And the symbolism that we have is this. Jesus, I am now giving you my lifestyle. She is saying, Jesus, you can now have my old life. This is how I made my living. You can now have it. The symbolism that we see here is that this woman is giving up her lifestyle and giving it to Jesus. This is the beauty of... Of what, of what Jesus has done for us, that we can give up our sin to him and he gladly takes it on himself. Verse 39 introduce, introduces us to this self-righteous man named, named Simon. He speaks down to the woman, look at verse 39. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet speaking of Jesus, would know what manner of woman this is who's touching him. For she is a sinner. Simon speaks down to this woman calling her a sinner, which Jesus is going to address the fact that she is a sinner, but he introduces her as such. 
But he's speaking out loud in public, just saying all these things about her and doubting who Jesus is. Now, this, the way this is taking place, the way this is happening, is very different than the way it would happen in our lives. Because if you and I were having a meal, then it would be really difficult for a stranger on the outside to come in our house, to come under our dinner table, to anoint our feet, to wash our feet, and nobody kick up a fuss about this. Nobody even say, uh, hey, pastor, uh, some woman's in your house and she's under the table and I don't know what's going on here, preacher. But their, their culture was so different. Most of their homes were built in these horseshoe, uh, L-shaped um, or U-shaped designs. And in the middle of them, they would have a courtyard and they would have their meals in the courtyard. And inside this courtyard, they would often have their meals on tables that were very close to the ground. So they would, they would lay down as they ate. And the, vet, the, the guests that would come on the scene were asked to come to the back side of the, or the front side of the table as they would serve them and they would lounge with their feet stretched out. And in stretching their feet out, it gave this woman the opportunity to walk up from behind and it wouldn't be unusual. As a matter of fact, when they would have these meals, it was common practice for them to do it in such a manner that the culture could come out on the outside and watch what's happening inside their courtyard. So for this woman to be there wasn't unusual. For our culture, this would be very unusual. But this self-righteous man viewed this woman in view of her sin. Aren't you glad this morning that Jesus doesn't look at you based on your sin, but based on what he did for you on the cross? But Jesus gives the sandwich or the parable here in verses 40 through 43. So we see that man named Simon and we see this sinful woman that's come on the scene. And then Jesus addresses the parable in verses 40 through 43. So the Simon has doubted who this or has doubted Jesus that he would know who this woman is. In verse 40. And Jesus said to him, speaking of Simon, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon said, well, then teacher, say it. And here's where the parable starts, verse 41. He says, There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. Denarii is just one day's wage. One owed him 500 denarii. The other owed him 50. When they had nothing for which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me which one of them would love him more. Verse 43, Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. The story here, or the parable here, is two debtors. One owes 500 days' work, so we're looking at two years. One owes 50 days' work, we're looking at two and a half months of work. And when the creditor forgives them both, Jesus says, which one do you think would love him more? And he responds, I guess the one who they forgave more. And then they, they continue on in their discussion. But the, but the issue we have on the table here this morning is understanding the depravity of sin. That neither one of them could pay, church. Neither. That's, the, that's the thing here. Yeah, he owed him 50 and he couldn't pay. He owed him 500 and he couldn't pay either. And which one would love him more? The one who, who, he, who he freely forgave more. Let me put it in perspective for all of us to understand this morning. Let's say that I drive down to, it's Monday morning, and I go to First Federal Bank. And I walk in and there's Becky's smiling face. Walk in and there she is. I'm doing my transaction, and I look to my right, and there's an older couple. And I look to my left, and there's a younger couple. And I look to the older couple, and I say, what, what y'all into today? And they look at me and say, we're making our, about to make our last mortgage payment. 30-year note. And we've been paying on it for 29 years and 11 months. And today's the day. And I look at them, and I say, just stop right there. And I walk over to the teller, and I say, I want to make their last payment for them. So sweet of me. <laughs> and then I walk over to the other couple, and I look at them, and I say, what, what are y'all into? And they look at me, and the young couple, you can tell they're newlyweds, and they say, we just bought our first home. 400 grand, home of our dreams. Home of our dreams, we love it. It's everything we could ever dream of. And today, as we just finished the paperwork on everything, we're making our first payment on our 30-year note today. And I look at them and say, how about you stop right there? Let me pay off that note for them. Here's 400 grand. Which one of those couples do you think loves me more? Which one you think loves me more? Which one you think is going to be more appreciative of me? I promise you the older couple, they're glad I did that. As a matter of fact, they probably went, 
Thanks, preacher. We love you. Give me a hug and walked out. And the younger couple, they're going to live in that house for the rest of their lives. And every day they're going to be, th they're going to be thankful for what I did for them or what that person did for them in paying off that mortgage. They literally are going to be forever indebted to that person for doing that for them. What? We don't understand, church family, that when it comes to the issue of sin, some of you may be saying, I've been sinning for 29 years and 11 months. Or some of you may be saying, I only got one sin to my name. Some of you may be saying, I'm so far in debt, I may never get out. When it comes to the issue of sin, here's the, here's the, the thing that's on the table. We all got it. Amen. We all got it. Some of y'all got one, and some of y'all got a thousand. Some of y'all got 50, and some of y'all got 500. And some of y'all got a whole bunch of sin, and some of y'all don't have near quite as much sin. But we all got it. And that's, the, that's the, the, the issue of Christianity. Can we, will we, and are we forgiven of our sin? Regardless of how we see ourselves, the one thing that we all need is the issue of forgiveness. Can you imagine if, how quickly that older couple and that younger couple in the bank, can you imagine how quickly that would hit social media? You don't believe what my preacher did. That older couple, man, I love my preacher. That younger couple, we going to that church. <laughs> you know how fast that word would spread? Guess what? That young couple that I just paid off their mortgage, for the rest of their life, they'll talk about me. For the rest, to all of their friends, they will talk about how much they love me. To the, forever, forever they'll talk about it. Why? Because it mattered to them. Because something happened that was so overwhelming and they were so grateful for it, they would talk about it. But you realize this morning that your sin is even greater than a 30-year mortgage. Your sin is forever, church. It's forever. We can't be wrong on this issue. You can't be wrong because your soul hangs in the balance. Billy Graham said it like this. He said, when God forgives us, he purifies us of our sin and he forgets our sin. And here's the good part. He said, forgiveness results in God dropping the charges that are held against us. Verses 44 through 46, we see what Simon and this woman, we see their lifestyles juxtaposed to one another. Watch this in verse 44. Jesus says, he turns to the woman and said to Simon. So Jesus is now, you know where he's at. He looks at this woman who's been kissing his feet and anointing him and Wiping his feet with her hair. He turns to this woman and he looks at Simon and he says, here's the deal. Watch what happens. He says, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. Why is that significant? It's a cultural, a cultural deal. They don't wear Nikes and, and, and walk on paved roads, all right? So they got sandals and dusty roads. It's a common practice when a guest enters the home or the courtyard of a home. The homeowner would have a bowl or a pot of water, usually a stone jar sitting right by that they could wash their feet as they entered into the home. Common practice. No different than us walking into somebody's house and shaking their hand. And Jesus says to them, you didn't give me any water. And this woman has been, wiping, been washing my feet with her tears. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, you gave me no kiss, but this woman's not ceased kissing me since I came in. It was common practice for them to kiss the guests on the cheek as they walked in. Not a romantic style kiss, just a kiss on the cheek to say, hey, we're, great. we're glad that you're here visiting with us. It's a sign of endearment and respect. He says, you haven't given me a kiss and she hasn't stopped. And then he says, you have not anointed my head with oil, but this woman has not stopped anointing me. That, that was the third common practice. They would take, the guests would take oil in their hands, and they would often put it on the head as the person walked in their home as a sign to just simply say, we're glad that you're here, welcome, and we're, we're happy to have you in our home. So if I'm keeping score, which I'm not, but if I'm keeping score, it's Simon zero, woman three. <laughs> but here's the beauty, I mean, here's the irony of this whole situation. Do you realize how this woman was introduced as the sinner? Do you realize what Simon called her? Jesus, this sinful woman. Do you realize what the text says about her? All we know is that she's a sinner. But Jesus says something very unique. Watch. Jesus says she's done everything right. And Mr. Pharisee, you haven't done any of it. Now public perception is a big deal. And we'll get to that in our third point in just a moment. But I want you to see how the religious man viewed himself as right and viewed this woman as wrong. 
And Jesus come on the scene and said, she's done everything you were supposed to do. The issue of forgiveness is a big issue. It's the issue. But when it comes to keeping score like this Pharisee here and looking down on this woman and saying, hey, she hasn't done, or look at this sinful woman, Jesus then says, hey, if you want to play that game, watch this. She's done more than you. Look at me, church. Look, you better be real, real careful when you start looking at other people's sin and saying, it's worse than mine. You may, as a matter of fact, you better be real careful when you start looking at other people saying, man, they're worse sinners than me. You better be real careful when you start viewing people only in view of what they have done wrong. Think about it, church. Maybe somebody had some huge sin, some huge issue, and it become public knowledge for everybody to know. And you look at them and say, man, what terrible sinners. For all you know, that's the only one they ever did. And you've got a thousand of them hid in your closet. So don't keep score. We all need forgiveness. All of us. But verse 47 and 48, Jesus didn't dodge the issue of her sin. He chose to forgive it, but he also addressed it. Look at verse 47. He says, therefore I say to you, her sins, watch church, which are many. Did you catch that? Jesus didn't run from the issue of her sin. Oh yeah, she's got a bunch of them. But they are forgiven. And they're forgiven, why? Because she loved much. Sinful woman never says a word in this text. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? She never said a word. The Pharisee had a whole bunch to say. Isn't that just like us today? Somebody broken in their sin comes into our, into our gathering. They can't even look up. They're so broken in their sinfulness. And they feel the weight of the gospel on them. And they know that they need to make things right. And they're, they are, they're ashamed of their sin. They recognize their sin. And they know that they are a sinner. And yet there's a, us religious people who many times need to just be quiet. And let the Holy Spirit of God do what only the Holy Spirit of God can do. Three things this morning as, as we wrap it up. Number one, Jesus made it very clear in this text that everybody has a sin debt. Jesus made it very clear that everybody has a sin debt. Pharisee saw himself as righteous. The woman knew that she was a sinner. But Jesus spoke in this parable to remind the Pharisee that he too was a sinner. Romans 6 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you look at this passage, you know what you find? They're, they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. A wage is what you deserve. A gift is what God gives you. Sin is the opposite of God, and eternal life is only found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the opposite of eternal life is the death from our sin. Did you watch how it just lined up? Watch, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Why is that important? Because this is how we receive forgiveness. It concludes by saying, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at me, church. Almost finished. The only difference between some of us in this room is that your sin's public and theirs is private. The only difference is that people don't know yours and maybe they know theirs. But you better rest assured, God knows it all. You are not hiding your sin from God. And this morning, if we are going to recognize the issue of forgiveness and recognize how much we need it, it doesn't matter if you owe him 500 denarii or 50 denarii. It doesn't matter if you have sinned a million times or one time. It doesn't matter. We all need the issue of forgiveness. Jesus made it clear everyone has a sin debt. Number two, everyone eventually has to respond to Jesus. Simon responded by doubting him. The woman responded by serving him. The crowd responded by questioning him, saying, who is this guy? He forgives sins? Eventually, everyone must confess that Jesus is Lord. Eventually, everyone has to come to that conclusion, whether it be, whether it be as they're cast from his presence or whether it be today uh, uh, on your own knees recognizing him as Savior. The one thing you cannot be, church, I've said this to you the last two weeks, you cannot be neutral with the gospel. You cannot say, one day I'm going to get right. Because watch, if you say, one day I'm going to make things right with Jesus, and if you think that you're, you're weighing the issue on this hand to say, this is eternal damnation and this is, this is the hope of eternal life, I'm weighing these issues, you're already an object of God's wrath. 
Because you're not looking at it to say, one day I'm going to pick between the two. You're already headed to one. Number three and last. Public perception will not get you into heaven. What's that, what does that mean? What does that have to do with this parable? Notice the two responses of the people in their relationship to their reputation. As I said a moment ago, Simon didn't do anything he was supposed to. And he is, he's the one acting like the sinful one. But what's public perception? He's the most religious guy in town. Did you notice the woman? She's the sinful one in town. And she's done everything the religious man was supposed to do. So what we have here is public perception saying, that guy's religious, surely he knows God. That woman's a sinner, surely she doesn't know God. And public perception will not get you into heaven. Public perception, it doesn't matter what the world thinks of you. Look, I can't stress this point to you enough. I'm real glad. I'm overly excited to know that all of y'all's opinion don't matter to me. I'm, I'm real glad about that. You know why? Because if I got to heaven and said, all right, let me walk through all the opinions of all the people and see if I got it right. Public perception won't get you into heaven. This man's public perception here, Simon's public perception, very, very religious. As a matter of fact, go ask anybody in this culture, this Pharisee, who he is, and they will all say, that's the most religious guy in town. Ask them who this sinful, adulterous, or this sinful uh, prostitute woman is. Who is she? She's the most wicked woman in town. And yet Jesus forgives her and condemns him. How is that possible, church? It's possible because Jesus sees to the heart, not the perception, not public opinion, and not just what you do outwardly, but he sees straight to your heart. What does this mean for us? It doesn't matter what the public thinks of you. It only matters what Jesus knows of you. You see the difference? It doesn't matter what public thinks of you. It only matters what Jesus knows of you. And there's no amount of sinfulness on your part that Jesus will not gladly and gloriously forgive. Do you hear me, church? There is no amount of sin on your part that Jesus will not gloriously and gladly forgive. <laughs> you, you want to sleep through that message? You go right ahead. You want to sleep through that point? You go right ahead. But I'm telling you, I needed this forgiveness. I needed it because I know how much I've sinned. And this morning, Jesus is never looking at us and saying, you're too far gone. And he's not looking at any of you and saying, you're so good you don't need me. He's not doing either of those. He can gladly and gloriously forgive. Do you know I can't out sin His grace? Y'all realize that? I can't out sin it. That's the good news of the gospel, church. If you trust Him now, do as He says to her. Your faith has saved you now. Go in peace. In conclusion, Simon and the sinful woman, both sinners, both in debt, both with no way to pay it off in this parable, both in desperate need of Jesus and his forgiveness, just like all of us desperately in need of Christ's forgiveness. Those who see Jesus as a great Savior are those who know themselves to be great sinners. Will you allow Jesus to forgive you of your sins this morning? Will you allow Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Let's stand together this morning. Not something I ever do here. Matter of fact, I rarely, if ever, do this. I'm going to ask you if you'll bow your head just for a moment. As I look over this congregation, I see people of all walks of life. In the stillness and the quietness of this room, will you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin and be your Savior? Father, I pray for Mount Vernon Baptist Church. God, as we all go our separate ways and go home, in the stillness of this moment, I pray that there are those who have prayed and asked you to save them. Lord, I pray that we will recognize that we all need forgiveness. God, help us to see this morning. Some of us are just bigger sinners than others, but we're all sinners. Thank you for dying on the cross to give us our only place that we have any hope of salvation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You want to wait on them?
They'll be back in just a moment.